Our next presenter is Kennedy Bucci, who is currently a PhD candidate in the Rocheman Lab at the University of Toronto. She's interested in the effects of anthropogenic pollutants in freshwater environments. Growing up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Kennedy spent her childhood swimming in the cold waters of Lake Superior and camping and hiking in the surrounding boreal ecosystem. Her connection with nature as a child has driven her passion for the environment. Kennedy? Yet, but thank you for the excellent um, and, and kind of, I don't know, kind of emotional um, bio. I, um, I am, yeah, living in Northern Ontario right now um, because of uh, kind of the ongoing pandemic and having to move home. There we go, I've got the sharing screen stuff. Um, having to move home because of that. Um, so it's I'm back in the boreal ecosystem and um, yeah, it feels it feels great to be home. Okay, so I hope you can see my um, full screen and not my notes. Um, we can. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to get started then. Um, and maybe my video now. Okay, great. <laughs> um, okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today and for um, staying to watch my talk after Abe's um, really, as he was, or as they were saying a bunch of times, this very beautiful talk. And I'm going to kind of bring us from this beautiful like macro view of our relationship um, to the ecosystem down to this really, really micro view because um, today what I'm going to be talking about is microplastics. Um, and I'm going to talk about the effects of microplastics in um, freshwater ecosystems. Specifically, uh, my research is done in Lake Ontario, um, so I know a lot about um, the effects of microplastics specifically in Lake Ontario, but of course that um, kind of scales to, to different freshwater ecosystems and even to marine ecosystems in, in a different way as well. Um, so yeah, I'm Kennedy. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate in the Rockman Lab at the University of Toronto. Um, and today, I again, I'm going to be talking just about my research um, on microplastics. There we go. Okay, so before I start talking about my specific research, I'm just going to give a quick background on um, microplastics and some trends in microplastics effects testing research that has informed my own research. Um, and so first of all, what do I mean when I talk about microplastics? Uh, well, microplastics are um, uh, this kind of suite of contaminants um, of all different shapes and sizes. So you can see in this, this image here, um, which is one sample that was collected from San, uh, San Diego Bay, um, I think, or San, yeah, San Diego Bay. And um, what I really want to highlight here is just the diversity of all the different um, shapes and colors and sizes and morphologies and different sources of microplastics that are all found within um, one small sample. Um, so you can see here some of the pellets, nurdles that um, I think John was mentioning in his intro that were, were found um, on the shorelines, but you can also see larger fragments and even tinier fragments that you can almost not even see just with your eye. You have to use a microscope to be able to see them. Um, but in addition to this variety of physical characteristics that microplastics can have, microplastics also have a chemical dimension. So microplastics in the environment um, have a cocktail of chemical contaminants which consists of additives from manufacturing, um, byproducts of the manufacturing process, and even environmental contaminants that are absorbed onto and into the plastic from the surrounding environment. Um, and those can be like persistent organic pollutants and heavy metals. And so this multidimensionality, this physical and chemical, um, these physical and chemical dimensions that microplastics have make them a really unique environmental pollutant and it also makes it really difficult to assess their true harm to wildlife. Um, so the chemical dimension of microplastics has been understudied in the past. Uh, the vast majority of effects testing research uses these virgin microplastics, which I call um, pre-consumer microplastics, um, that have a really low, um, or sorry, a relatively low contaminant load compared to microplastics that would be found in the environment. And consequently, studies that expose organisms to pre-consumer microplastics 
likely misunderstand or underestimate the true effects of microplastics in the environment because they're ignoring this entire dimension of microplastics. And so now, yeah, as I said, I was gonna just talk about a bit, some of the general trends in microplastics effects testing and specifically on fish. Um, so the majority of microplastics effects testing studies um, adult fish um, and to a lesser extent juvenile fish, while much fewer um, study larval fish or even um, fish in their embryonic stage. Um, and this specific review, this Jacob et al. 2020 review, um, actually found no studies that exposed fish to microplastics over multiple life stages. So for example, from the larval to juvenile to adult stage and no studies that looked at multiple generations of fish. So um, exposing, exposing fish until their reproduction and then exposing the offspring. Um, the studies also tended to use polyethylene and polystyrene microplastics, um, which makes sense because these are the, some of the most commonly produced and polluted um, types of plastic. Um, but however, they also used, uh, tended to use spherical microplastics and to a much lesser extent fragments and barely any used fibers. Um, and this is kind of contrary to what we would see in the environment where spheres are actually the least commonly found microplastic shape and fibers are the most. And it's also contrary to um, how we see, how we view the toxicity of microplastics where fibers have been shown to be extreme or much more to toxic or harmful to organisms than, than spheres are. So um, yeah, this can be very problematic because of the shape dependent toxicity. So we're testing the mo testing, most of testing happens with spherical particles, but in the environment, what we see and what causes effects are the fiber and fragment particles. So early in my PhD, I also did a literature review on um, effects testing with both macro and micro plastics in freshwater ecosystems. And so I saw a lot of these trends early on in my research, which led me to design my lab experiments that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm answering three specific questions. First of all, um, what are the long-term effects of microplastics to fish over their entire life cycle? Um, do microplastics affect the offspring of an exposed generation? And what are the effects of pre-consumer microplastics compared to microplastics that we collect from the environment? So in my experiments, I used um, the fathead minnow, which is a prey species that is commonly used in ecotoxicity testing with different types of contaminants. Um, they're commonly found in freshwater lakes and rivers throughout North America and are prey to many pasivorous fish, including northern pike and the walleye that Abe and John were talking about earlier, which in where I am in northern Ontario, we call this pickerel. Um, and in the lab, these fish can be uh, made to use or made to reach sexual maturity uh, just within a few months. So they're an ideal species to use for full life cycle testing. Um, and then furthermore, they're also continuous spawners. So they'll continue to produce eggs and provide us lots of data points for um, our transgenerational experiments. So in a lab at the um, Ontario Ministry of the Environment, I exposed fathead minnows to microplastics for their entire life cycle from their egg stage through development and into their reproductive phase. And then I also raised a subset of their offspring in clean water for five days. And so the parental generation were exposed to polyethylene microplastics from two different sources. One that I had purchased from a manufacturer called Craft Pellets and the other that I collected from the shoreline of Lake Ontario in downtown Toronto near a highly polluted tributary. And the important difference between these two plastic types is their chemical makeup. So the pl plastics that I purchased from a manufacturer have a limited chemical cocktail consisting of unreacted oligomers and few plastic additives. But the plastics I collected from Lake Ontario had um, unreacted oligomers, a full suite of plastic additives, as well as any plastics that they would absorb from uh, Lake Ontario. And those chemicals could be uh, like legacy chemicals, pesticides, and heavy metals. And finally, I used a low and a high concentration of each of these plastic types. Um, and the lower of these two concentrations is realistic to what we would find in the environment. And even the high concentration is realistic to what would be found in kind of hot, these like hot spots. So like near wastewater treatment plant outflow, um, for example. 
Okay, so now I'm going to jump into some of the results from this experiment, um, starting with our first que question about the effects of microplastics to the parental generation. And first of all, I'm going to say uh, we found very few statistically significant changes at the individual level to the parental generation um, for endpoints like survival and growth. Um, but we did see a few slight changes that point towards kind of a larger trend with microplastics affecting the reproduction of these fish. Um, so the first reproductive endpoint that we'll look at is how quickly the fish began maturing. And so just to orient you to this graph, I'm going to show this, this type of graph throughout my presentation. Um, so I have my control here, uh, the pre-consumer plastic type, an environmental microplastic type, and then there'll be a low and high concentration for each of these two treatments. And on the y-axis here, we have percent mature, um, but the y-axis will change in, the, in each of the graphs. Okay. Um, so we characterized the fish as either being mature or immature based on their secondary sex characteristics um, at multiple time points over the six month experiment, um, beginning at about four months. So this was at 118 days post, post hatch. So that's 118 days old. Um, so at this time point, we saw that the fish in the high dose of the environmental microplastic treatment had higher average percent maturity than the other treatments, including the control meaning that these fish began to mature earlier than the other fish. Um, but this trend uh, kind of evened out by the next time point, which was 125 days post-hatch, so about a week later. Um, and at that point, the rest of the treatments had caught up and they were all kind of at the same level of, of maturity. Next, I'm gonna uh, look at the condition factor of the fish. And the condition factor is an index of how plump the fish is. So a more plump fish will have a larger condition factor um, and a less plump fish will have a smaller condition factor. Um, and condition factor can vary naturally with seasons, um, with how much food is available, with the reproductive status of the fish, as well as um, with the contaminant load in the surrounding ecosystem. So some studies have shown that um, the presence of organic chemicals in the environment can cause the, the fish to have um, to become more plump, to have this larger condition factor. Um, and we didn't see, so just uh, to show you the results, and here again on the y-axis we have condition factor. Um, in the male fish, uh, we didn't see any significant changes in condition factor, but in the females, we saw that the females in the high dose of this environmental microplastic treatment had slightly elevated condition factor, meaning they were a bit more plump than the other fish um, at the end of the experiment. And this could have been um, potentially a result of exposure to org organic contaminants, um, or it could also point towards slight differences in the reproductive status of the fish. Okay, and now I'll move on to um, looking at the clutch size of the female. So this is how many um, eggs were produced by each female in the treatment. Um, so in this, uh, at this metric, we see that the fish in the low dose of the environmental microplastic treatment had that, which is this bar here, had larger clutches on average, meaning that the females laid more eggs at a time than in the other treatments. And this is only a very slight um, effect. You can see the average here is a, is a bit higher than the average of the controls, which is that open dot. Um, so next we can see how this translates into the total number of eggs produced per female. And here we can see that although the low environmental microplastic treatment had um, more eggs per clutch, um, as at the end of the experiment, the total reproductive output by the fish um, are, are pretty even and maybe just slightly elevated in the pre-consumer microplastic treatments and the low dose of the environmental microplastic treatment compared to the control and the environmental microplastic treatment um, in the high dose. Um, but these are very slight uh, trends and not statistically significant. Okay, so to answer that first question of, of the long-term impacts of microplastics in the parental generation, we saw that neither plastic type had a very big impact on the survival, growth, or reproductive output of the fish um, when exposed to microplastics. But next we'll look at how these effects, whether these effects tra um, translate over to the offspring of the fish. And to answer that question, we raised um, the offspring from the exposed parental generation for five days in clean water. And we looked at endpoints at the embryonic stage and also at the larval stage for these offspring. Okay, so we characterized the eggs as either being alive, broken, or dead. 
Um, the alive and dead categories are pretty self-explanatory, um, but the broken category here refers to any eggs that broke during the handling and processing of the, of the, um, of the eggs. And so the eggs from each of the treatments were handled exactly the same. So we should see um, exactly the same uh, levels of broken eggs in each treatment. Um, but what we ended up seeing was that the, um, there is a higher proportion of broken eggs in the low dose of the environmental microplastics than any of the other treatments, including um, in the control. So this could possibly be explained by the eggs in this treatment being more fragile than the eggs in the other treatments or having thinner shells. Um, in the environment, eggs that are more fragile would likely have a much lower survival rate because of the harsher conditions associated with living in a natural ecosystem compared to living in, um, in an aquarium in my lab. Um, and so the fragility of these eggs is something that I'm still investigating uh, using histological analysis of the female gonads. And so in this picture on the right, you can see one very large um, mature egg, and that's an egg that's still in the gonads of the female. Um, so using histological techniques and looking under a microscope, I can measure the thickness of the eggshells to determine whether the eggshells are thinner as a result of exposure to environmental contaminants, um, and that's work that's still ongoing. I was going to say in my lab, but in my, my house. Um, so the final endpoint that I'll discuss from this experiment is the rate of deformities in the larvae after five days. And so for this endpoint, we actually see quite a significant increase in the percentage of deformed fish in the low dose of the environmental treatment compared to all the other treatments, including the control. And so here are some of the examples of the types of deformities that we would see in fish exposed to microplastics from Lake Ontario. So figure A here shows a normal healthy fish, um, and figure B shows a larvae with deformed spine as well as a truncated tail. Um, figure C shows a fish with multiple edemas around its eyes, yolk sac, and heart. Um, figure D shows a fish that was not able to emerge from its shell um, and died as a result of that. And figure E shows an abnormal growth in the tail of one of the fish. And of course, um, deformities in fish will cause the fish to have greatly reduced fitness in the natural environment because they won't be able to escape predation as easily or find resources. Um, and so they're much less, li less likely to survive until adulthood. Okay, so now that we've answered the first two questions, we kind of already have an idea of the answer to the third question. But just to summarize, we've seen that both the pre-consumer and environmental microplastics had limited effects on the parental generation in terms of the survival, growth, and total reproductive output. Um, however, we saw that the environmentally sourced microplastics caused impacts to the offspring of these fish that the, the pre-consumer microplastics did not. Um, in the offspring generation, we saw an increased rate of broken eggs and an increased rate of deformed larvae. So the results of this sh study show that environmentally sourced microplastics can actually impact the offspring of exposed generation of exposed parents, even when those offspring are raised in clean water. And so to conclude this section of my talk, I want to bring this slide back up from the beginning. Um, earlier, I made the point that microplastics are both a physical and a chemical stressor, but that the chemical dimension of the microplastics has been understudied in the past. And many studies using these pre-consumer microplastics have concluded that microplastics may not be as big of a threat as we previously or would have thought. Um, but based on the results of my study, I've shown that microplastics sourced from the environment can actually have a bigger effect um, to fish and especially to the offspring of exposed fish than microplastics that were purchased from a, directly from a manufacturer. And so what I'm showing, what I'm, what the kind of take home message of my, of my talk is, is that um, in the field of microplastics research, um, we may have to this point been underestimating the true effects of microplastics in the environment. And we really need to consider this chemical dimension of microplastics because there are this entire suite of chemical contaminants that are really important in understanding the true effects of microplastics to wildlife. Okay, and so just before I move on to kind of the solutions-based section of my talk, um, I briefly want to show you some of the ongoing work that I'm associated with at the Experimental Lakes area in Northern Ontario, because this is a really exciting project that I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of seeing the results of. 
So if you're not familiar with the Experimental Lakes area, um, it's a research station in Northern Ontario, it's located here, um, that has 58 lakes set aside for um, research, for environmental research. And so just to give you an idea of the scope of Ontario, um, the Experimental Lakes area up here is a 21 hour drive, which is 2000 kilometers. And I put this in miles because I know in America we use miles, 1200 miles um, away from Toronto, which is the same distance as driving from Toronto all the way down to Florida. Um, okay, and so that's just a picture of our lake that we're working on. Um, and if you are familiar with the experimental lakes at all, it would be because of this really famous um, pro or experiment that was done in the 70s by Dr. David Schindler and his colleagues. And they put, um, in this project, they put this curtain across one of the lakes. This is Lake 226, uh, the experimental lakes area. And they dosed one side of the lake with carbon and nitrogen and the other side of the lake with carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Um, and they were able to prove that excess phosphorus was causing algal blooms in the system. And um, this, this picture on the, the left here um, was called one of the most influential pictures in the history of oenology or something like that. And so that just gives you kind of an idea of the projects that happen at ELA have global impact on policy. And so that's one of the reasons why we're really excited to be doing this microplastics research at the Experimental Lakes area. And so the project that I was involved with over the summer um, was happening in this lake, which is Lake 378. Um, I spent a lot of time at this lake over the summer. Um, and here we installed these um, in-lake mesocosms, um, which were basically just enclosures where we were able to, to kind of separate a community of um, different organisms and expose them with microplastics at different concentrations. And so here you can see in this picture, this is one of the enclosures and these enclosures are 10 meters across and two meters deep. Um, and you can see the three different types of microplastics um, that we used to expose the, to the community to, um, which were polyethylene, polypropylene and polyethylene terephthalate. And they each had a, a suite of chemicals of um, plastic additives as well. Um, we also added the communities of zooplankton, phytoplankton, and microbes, as well as a population of yellow perch. And so my um, part of this project was to investigate effects at the um, at different levels to the, to the health of the population of yellow perch. So here is a rare sighting of a school of yellow perch in one of the enclosures. Um, I was really excited to be able to take this picture because um, in a 10 meter enclosure, fish that are about um, 90 millimeters are really hard to spot. Um, and here's one that we, what, when we were sacrificing them for their dissections, um, here's a picture of one of the, the fish at the end. Um, and of course, this project is a highly, highly collaborative project. So it just gives you a scope of um, how many people are working on this project. I'm here. PhD one, that's me. Um, and then there's all these different PIs and collaborators that are working on different questions um, in the ecosystem and in the, in the corrals themselves. Um, and this, this project, as I was mentioning before, is, is this really novel project that we're excited about the results for because they'll um, most definitely impact um, the future of microplastics research and hopefully global policy around, around plastic pollution. And here is finally just a picture of the project 2021 or the plastics project 2021 field team. Um, so because of COVID restrictions at the field station, um, only a few of us were able to stay for the entire summer. So um, me and three others were actually kind of bubbled at the field station over the summer and we weren't able to leave for four months um, at this field station that's in like this remote part of Northern Ontario that doesn't have cell coverage and is run off a diesel generator. <laughs> so we got this really uh, unique experience at the, at the Experimental Lakes Area Field Station um, this previous summer. Okay, and so you can, you can kind of stay tuned for the results of this project um, if you scan this QR code here, um, or if you visit the Rockman Lab um, website or my website.
Okay, so for the last couple minutes of my presentation, I just want to talk a bit about kind of these solutions based um, or like evidence based solutions um, that I, I have been working on and mostly the University of Toronto trash team um, has been developing. Um, and so the University of Toronto trash team is um, really focused on improving waste literacy in the community, mitigating plastic pollution in Lake Ontario, as well as informing policy. Um, it's the U University of Toronto trash team is a, a science based community outreach group made up of undergrads, grad students, postdocs, researchers, local volunteers and staff. Um, we use education, public outreach and scientific research to deliver evidence based solutions to decrease solid waste and help to promote a circular economy. Um, our community outreach group includes kind of setting up these interactive booths at local events as well as doing cleanups around the city and at the harbor front. Um, we also have an elementary school program that was de developed to fit within the Ontario curriculum for fifth and sixth graders. And we've had volunteers doing in-class and virtual visits throughout the pandemic. And finally, we have some data-driven projects like the one I'm about to share that will be used to help inform solutions. So um, in August of 2019, uh, Ports Toronto installed two sea bins in the outer harbor marina. And we've had um, sea bins in the Toronto Harbor ever since um, throughout the summer, summer season. Um, so these little sea bins are kind of like floating trash cans that help clean up litter from the water surface by pumping water through this mesh bag. Um, and it kind of creates this vacuum that draws in debris that's floating by. Um, and volunteers go out and characterize the the waste that is found in these sea bins kind of on a, I think on a daily basis when the, when the um, sea bins are installed. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit of some of the results of what, what kind of stuff we can collect in these sea bins. So here's just a quick overview of the larger items that the sea bins collect. Um, the majority of them are like food packaging, cigarette butts, kind of your, the typical stuff that you would see. Um, just you know, floating in the lake. Um, but there's also they're also collecting smaller items like microplastics. So they have a few some pellets and hard fragments um, that are all collected in these sea bins. And they used the data from 2021 to estimate that if a sea bin were installed 24 hours a day, um, it would collect 0 0.03 kilograms of trash which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's about 210 pieces of plastic per day. Um, so that, that could amount to, you know, kind of a significant amount of trash that's getting collected from the lake. And so the U of T trash team and Ocean Conservancy worked together to found the International Trash Trapping Network, um, which is a network of sea bins and scientists that collect data to qualitatively um, measure the impact and inform local source reduction. So um, your harbor front might already have a sea bin. Um, I know in Thunder Bay, we do have a sea bin installed in the marina. And so you can log on to their website and um, find their standardized protocol for auditing the trash and start to contribute um, to the global data set um, with your own harbor front. Okay, and that's all I have for my presentation today. And so um, I'd just like to thank the organizer, organizers of the conference for inviting me and putting on this um, really excellent and informative um, conference. And thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, Kennedy, thanks for your talk. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to move out of the sunshine there. Um, so if anybody has questions, again, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A and I will monitor both of them and we'll get through a couple and then um, the rest of them, Kennedy, I'll send to you in a document. Great. So the first, there are a couple questions. Um, the first question is, have there been any studies about the impact of plastic exposed to ice and winter conditions versus plastic that might be floating in the ocean that doesn't get frozen during the year? Um, I can't, I can't think of any that have. That's a, a really excellent question though. Um, if, if I were speaking from, just speaking from my own experience, I would say that the microplastics that are exposed to kind of ice conditions would definitely be um, breaking up into smaller and smaller microplastics more quickly than microplastics that are floating in the, in the ocean. Because we know that um, microplastics, when they get abraded, 
kind of these little tinier microplastics break up off this, the plastic. Um, if you think about like your car tires, every time you drive on the, on asphalt or anywhere, um, your tires wear down and those little pieces of plastic that come off pieces of rubber that come off your tires are breaking up into more microplastics. So kind of the same idea could apply to ice where ice is abrading like plastic products and causing them to break up um, even more. But I don't know of any studies that have explicitly tested that. Um, maybe you can make that into a proposal. <laughs> Test that yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, the next question is, it has to do with, um, actually, I'm going to restructure that. Uh, have you studied the impact of polystyrene? Because you were looking at polyethylene. Have you also looked at polystyrene? Yeah, um, not personally. Um, I haven't. But when I did my so the first chapter of my PhD thesis was a uh, meta-analysis of all studies that have exposed organisms to any type of microplastics. And we found a bunch that had had exposed um, different organisms to, to polystyrene microplastics. And um, polystyrene is a really interesting, from a, like a, a polymer chemistry perspective, um, it's a really interesting case study because um, polystyrene uh, like styre has these like they're called styrenic compounds um that are known to have like endocrine disrupting properties and when um other studies have exposed organisms to polystyrene more often than not they find effects to the organism's reproduction so whether it's it's i think it's mostly been kind of like increase in reproductive output um, but I'd have to kind of dive back into the literature to, to remember exactly what all the, the endpoints were. But I, I know that kind of like the general consensus was that they kind of have these reproductive endpoint effects um, more so than other types of microplastics, which is yeah kind of concerning. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> Um, okay, the next question is, is U of T also involved in the land version of Sieben's Litotraps? Uh, the, yeah, the litter traps. I I know that there are some in Toronto, and I don't know if we audit those. Um, yeah, the U of T trash team has grown a lot over the past just couple of years since it's been um, since we like kind of started it. Uh, and I know there's a lot of different groups working on different projects, and I I can't remember off the top of my head if if we work on litter traps. Sorry, we have them in Clayton. That's we're. Oh. I'm just, I, I think that's where that one came from. Yeah, the little uh, are cool. I like the style yeah, of those. Yeah, both really wonderful. Yeah. Um, so if you asked another question, I will put it in a document and then Kennedy, I'll send that to you so you can answer it. Um, and I'm gonna hand it back over to John. Thank you for your talk. Yep. Kennedy, thank you very much. Uh, I was interested to see the your comment there on the sea bends because we've looked at getting one or two sea bends in the Thousand Islands area. Uh, we think they would be effective collectors of trash. Uh, so that's on our horizon. We need to find the funding for them, obviously. You know. So thank you very much. 